what's important to you. So if you're like looking to get a suppressor, like you really do have to make this list of what what's your top priority. Yeah. Is it price? Because you might not have as much of a say in all these other things then. Well, if it's weight, well, then you might not, you know, you might be stuck with a certain type of material. If it's length, okay, then we might not get it as quiet as you want. All right, everybody, we've got a good one here. If you've listened to our podcast for a while now, at some point in time in the past, we had the guys across the table on with Mark and myself. We have Adam Maxwell and Ruben Alex, and here to carry on talking more and more about suppressors. So uh, I know we certainly convinced Mark in that episode, and actually over the course of a couple of hunts since then, especially our last uh, our coyote series. If you missed that, go back and check it out, our Nebraska coyote series. Very interesting stuff. Uh, Mark, you've been convinced to want to get into suppressors. You've always thought suppressors are cool, never had an issue with them, but it was kind of like, you know, there's the... Oh, do I want to wait all this time? There's a tax stamp. Do I want to, you know, like do it in a way to make sure, like, am I somehow going to become a criminal by owning one? Just so, but now, you know, it's really not that bad of a process. You want to get one. Yeah. You know I mean? And I don't have one yet. I do want to get one. I think part of it is almost like a philosophical opposition to the fact that you have to get the tax stamp and stuff like that, but I'm done boycotting it. I think I'm going to begin this journey, Jim, but you're right, man. I mean, there are so many advantages. Uh, It's probably a little late to uh, mitigate the, the chronic <laughs> ringing in my ears right now, but uh, maybe we can prevent further damage, and I think suppressors can do that. I did hear, or I did learn that all hearing damage is cumulative, so no time like the present then to stop the bleeding. Bam. You don't get it back. Noted. So, no, I mean, I mean, that is, you don't. You don't, and, and yeah. as a kid, you're growing, you're like, ah, not me, like, meh, yeah. eh, eh, and all of a sudden you're like, this isn't normal. Right. <laughs> Yeah, picture, if you, if you want a volume it, knob that you couldn't turn back down. Yeah, if you want to <laughs> see that illustrated, go to a gun club, uh, the Wednesday night members meeting, and and listen to how many times you hear people say what? Yeah, yeah. huh? The yeah. what? <laughs> the civil discourse what? of a of a gun board <laughs> gun club board meeting. <laughs> oh man, they're gonna write about most this of it based on on misunderstandings. <laughs> oh, boy. The names are different, but the people are the same, no matter where you go. <laughs> So, hopefully, uh, with all that said, and, and if you haven't caught our last episode, which is Why Suppressed, uh, that's the one I'm referring to, um, check it out. But if you've been convinced you want to do the whole suppressor thing, I think one of the um, one of the fun parts about getting a suppressor, but also it can be a bit complicated, and you got to look around a bunch, and there's differing opinions all over the place, is which suppressor are you going to get? I mean, you know, we sometimes have the... Um, the fun, I'll say the joy of explaining to different people, different people, what different scopes are good for. Right. Mm -hmm. So in the end, we realize that to the untrained eye, most rifle scopes all kind of look like black tubes with turrets on them. Right. And there's some that are just a little bit different size and length, but otherwise they all kind of look about the same. And I will say that with suppressors, it's, it's a very similar thing. I mean, they're all black tubes. They don't even have turrets on them. They're all just black tubes that get put on the end of a gun. Some yeah. of them are long, some of them are fatter, some of them are skinnier, shorter, whatever. And uh, it's hard to figure out which one's best for you. Yeah, I, they're the people I'm, of firearms accessories. <laughs> <laughs> I make the joke uh, that like rifle scopes from from ten feet away are all the same. Yeah, you know, it's like if you're not looking through it, and it and it looks like relatively the same, they're all the same. Right. So, and, um, and up close, suppressors are even less interesting because mm. you don't look through them at all. It's a tube. Yeah. <laughs> when, I was, when I was in retail, people would always want to come in for cordial visits with their suppressors that are in jail. And it's I like, think that's conjugal visits. There you go. No. Well. The, yeah. Anyway, well, I hope they, they wanted. To, they're I like, hope. pull it out of the back so I can see it. it. That, well, that, that sounds. That sounds uncomfortable. That I mean, sound, isn't even. <laughs> that sounds illegal. Oh, that's, it's, that's more illegal than not having the stamps. Oh, it's weird. Believe me. <laughs> But they, yeah, they pick it up and they look like, oh, mean. that's, oh, well, that's yeah, it. cool. It's still here. Like, Do they talk yeah. to it? Like sometimes, sometimes, but they are, it's just, it's a black tube it's on like, the end yeah, and you don't tube. appreciate it until you shoot through one mm-hmm. and uh, you attach it to your gun. So, um, you guys have a lot of suppressors that you've either shot with or that you own. I might have to move this for getting oh. fuzzy. 
uh, that you own or that you've shot with, and um, probably of many different types. Some of them are going on carbines, some of them are going on long range rifles, pistols, rim fires, rim fires for sure. Heck, even mm-hmm. shotguns. We've done a ten minute talk on that with Mr. Dan. Muzzle here. loaders. Did right. you say muzzle loaders? Muzzle loaders. Oh yeah, I got one of those. And uh, so, how are you going about? Like, I guess we first have to, you know, probably. Uh, clarify which type of firearm we're talking about. You know, let's just start off, for example, with like, your classic bolt action rifle. Yep. How are you sifting through all the different kinds of suppressors that are available? All of them can be claiming different decibel levels. So there's there's different um, calibers that they're designed for, rated for. There's you know there's full auto what ones. I don't need that because it's just going mm-hmm. in a bolt gun, right? Um, there's there's three there's doing? three big categories that you can chop. All the products down into first that helps. One is rim fire. Okay, they're their own thing. Uh, pistol, they're their own thing. Right. And center fire high pressure rifle. Okay, yep. they're their own thing. And there's there some crossover. There I mean, is there, some there crossover. Can be right. Crossover, right? Right. Yeah, but like generally speaking, that's like they've taken one kind and kind of adapted it to do other stuff. But like that's that's. The three categories that you can kind of slice and dice right down the bat. So if you know if you're talking about bolt action rifles, I assuming center fire rifles. Sure. Yeah. So we're talking about rifle cans. Yeah. You know, and then and then you go down into attachment uh, method, um, decibel rating, uh, construction size, weight, weight. size, weight, size weight, weight, things yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. I think a and lot then, of times that's. I mean, like yeah. size and weight and attachment method are really like. In rifle cans, that's that's what it is. And then firing schedule. Are yeah. you are, do you want do you want to get it hot often, or is it yeah. something that's going to go on a hunting rifle and not never see an aggressive firing schedule? Okay, got but it. I think it's pretty fair to say that you know, like in the world of what's sold on the market right now, I was listening to something that Silencer Shop did um, recently, and they and basically said that about sixty percent of the suppressors that are sold in the U.S. are run through Silencer Shop kiosks. And uh, which we can get into a little bit later. It's kind of a cool way to do it and to make all the tax stuff really easy to understand. Um, but about 60% of the suppressors in the country are sold through them. And the vast majority of those are um, 30 caliber direct thread rifle cans. So, right so when we look at that, um, there is, yeah, because I think that, that, you know, is the kind of the majority of the, the lower cost too. Mm-hmm. Like it takes a couple yeah. hundred dollars off of a suppressor. That's you know, true. when you figure a hundred dollar attachment that they have to include with the can, and then and then adapting some sort of quick release method or quick attach method. Oh, you're talking um, about just kind of the direct thread part of it. Yeah. Then. So yep, it, yep. it'll thread to you know five ace twenty four or half half twenty eight or whatever you want it. But you know that I think is a lot of the cans that are that are sold, and so that's the direction a lot of people. And go. you said th- and you said thirty cal was what percent? Uh it's the vast majority. The vast majority. It wasn't mm-hmm. a percentage. Yeah. Or, but, so. That's interesting to me too. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. because I think, like, all right, diving into the wood caliber can or whatever, or mm-hmm. what it's what it's spec'd out for. I think would you say that because you know it's a two hundred dollar tax stamp on top of generally speaking they can be pretty costly suppressors on mm-hmm. top of that, and you have the waiting time. So usually people aren't. I say usually. I don't know. Maybe some days people are, but most people will want to ideally get maybe one or two. There's mm-hmm. people out yeah. there and plenty of people out there who are all like, add to cart all of the suppressors. But a lot of people out there do just want to see if they can get by with one or two. Yep. So if you go with like a 30 cal can, that's going to work with your 308. It's going to work with your 30 out six hunting six rifle. Five, it's going to work with your six five. Mag. Yeah. It's gonna, and then it's also going to work with your 223 yep. and some of the other smaller calibers and like, you know, 20 something cal. Yep. So is that like, it's it's not really an issue, I think, just for clarification for people out there to shoot a smaller caliber through a suppressor than it's technically designated no, for. No, right? and actually, like it can be better at times. Like if you were running, um, you know, an AR gas gun of some sort, or even a piston driven gun, that larger bore can actually allow some of that back pressure to escape faster instead of forcing it back down the barrel in you know through the ejection port. So. Um, talking with some industry guys that, that work for a company that makes suppressors, a lot of times they will actually like purposefully run 30 cal bore suppressors with five, five, six guns. Interesting. Uh, and you, does that just and keep the can, whole system like cleaner then? You're not, or well, you're also getting increased volume. Then? Generally speaking, yeah. 30 caliber cans are larger, mm-hmm. like in volume. 
Yeah. To, for a suppressor to work, essentially, we have baffles that have to get close to the bullet. Yep. And then we need a volume of space for that gas to expand into. And generally speaking, a 30 caliber can, like, I mean, on the table, we have we have a, a Silencer Co. Saker. The 5.56 version of this is physically smaller. Gotcha. Yeah. So by putting the 7.62 on there, you are attaching a larger expansion chamber than the comparable 5.56 model. Gotcha. And right. you do one one area that you can suffer a little bit in doing this. Like like this can's got a replaceable end cap, so you could put a 6.5 end cap or a 2.23 end cap oh. mm-hmm. uh, on it, but you're really only taking one baff it's not even a baffle it's just a cap so you're not really reducing um the decibels that much by going from one end cap to a smaller one to match your bore uh i think the for for what i've remember hearing um if you were to go like from a 30 cal can down you know and you shoot instead of a 308 in it you shoot like a 270 you could lose a decibel or so of Mm -hmm. sound reduction um going from there to six five could be about the same so you could lose three to four decibels going down to like a 223 okay so if it says it's you know it'll bring center fire to 130 decibels or something like that or 138 decibels or whatever ends up uh hearing safe is about 140 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so if you were running uh, a can that kind of was on that ragged edge of taking a 30 cal down to hearing safe you might be slightly above hearing safe with that like a 223 through it even gotcha. though it has more volume yeah and that's just because you are getting some of that gas escaping around the bullet as the bullet's exiting so oh, okay yeah. so but the benefit of that would be that a lot of times a can with larger volume has better tone and so tone is something that if you could test suppressors in a gun shop and if you go to a dealer that allows you to you know go back in the range or something and test a suppressor you'll find that tone is one of those things that can be equally as important as the actual decibel rating because hmm. how it sounds but you can't put a number on yeah tone. you can't objectively measure it. it's kind of like it's kind of like buying a guitar and yeah. going to the guitar store and playing all of them like yep. you can't you can't articulate the difference between maybe a little would, bit m- but would one i'm just trying to process it so would one like it might have more of a crack and the yeah. other one will yeah, be like more even though or... like the decibels could be the same but it'll almost yeah. be more pleasant to your ear yeah yeah higher there's... pitched lower you know more yeah like it would a be thud pitch. noise yeah. more yeah. of a pitch yeah pitch to, yeah. okay so gotcha. so there i find that when you shoot like i've got a couple of uh direct thread titanium suppressors mm-hmm. um and i find that those i like the tone better on that than comparing it to i have a suppressor that has a titanium sleeve but uh stainless baffles mm-hmm. i actually like the tone of a titanium suppressor in that case, with mm-hmm. that specific gun, now I'm not saying across the board like titanium suppressors are going to have better tone, but mm-hmm. but if you set them side by side and two identical guns, you can tell one of them sounds different. Interesting, and it's just more pleasing to the ear. I've got a so talking about you know you're talking about a, a 30 cal. It's kind of this is not the case, but it's kind of like oh I want one suppressor to do it all, so I'll get the 30 and I can run my 556 five, in it and all that good stuff. Are you making? A compromise with that with size and weight though there's like always if, compromises yeah yeah mm-hmm. absolutely yeah. everything's compromise it's yeah so so one of the things that can happen jim like you said a lot of times people will like i want to buy one or two suppressors i'm not looking to get a bunch of them my recommendation would be you know if you want a suppressor that you can put on multiple guns you may want to look at getting that one as you know having um a quick attach method, you know, something, something, uh, yeah. the, you know, the, the dead air chemo or the sounds Co ASR or something mm-hmm. like that, you know, something, uh, that you can have these muzzle brakes or flash hiders on multiple guns and this suppressor can go on all of them. That's, I think where a lot of that maybe compromise happens in that you would buy a 30 cal suppressor just so that you don't take a 223 can and put it on a 30 cal accidentally because they have the same muzzle device. So that can be compromised where mm-hmm. you're you're getting a system that's not really optimized for any one thing, but it'll work with, with all of them. We talk about that with rifle scopes all the time. The person who wants the do-all rifle scope, well, you might end up getting a rifle scope that sacrifices in one area or another. It's kind of like if you want to be able to shoot long range, but you buy a one to six, you might be sacrificing some of that precision at longer ranges, your ability to see the target. Mm-hmm. But then... When you when you look at like uh, in suppressors, if you want to be able to switch it from multiple guns, you know you might have to get 
a muzzle device that doesn't match your barrel profile on one of those guns perfectly and so now it kind of looks funky hanging out there on the end or if you were going with a direct thread suppressor you might have to thread a barrel on one of your guns to a thread that you might not normally thread that barrel to right Hmm. like uh just generally speaking a lot of 223 caliber guns or 22 caliber guns will come threaded half 28 a lot of guns above that six millimeter and up will be threaded five base 24 to really have a a thicker diameter around the bore at the muzzle so you have a little more meat Mm -hmm. uh and if you were to say like i want to buy a direct thread half 28 can with a 30 caliber hole through it now all of a sudden you got to thread your 6.5 to a half 28 and then your barrel's starting to get really thin around the muzzle crown i mean it sounds like the answer is actually more suppressors that is, so You're that's usually wrong. how it starts, <laughs> and I could even use myself an example. The first one I put a stamp on was one of the one of those cans that was is what is very much advertised as one of those do alls. Like it, it's lightweight. It's thirty cal. It's got all the end caps. It's got all the you know attachment you know modularity on the attachments. You can do QD. You can do direct thread. You can do all those things. And I shot that one just long enough to figure out. Which of those compromises were important to me? <laughs> yeah. And, and then I was like, you know what? This one does have a fast attach system, but I don't like this one. Hmm. Right. Or yeah. I, you know, yeah, it is pretty lightweight, but it's not quite light enough. Or, you know, it doesn't sound quite good on, and that's usually, so you go down one, the road. Like or, a, or like, I thought I was going to use this on 30 cal guns, but I'm pretty much only using it on ARs. And that's yeah. me. So yeah. like now I'm like five five six can guy because like that's really what I use them for. Mm-hmm. I have a dedicated. So. I have two dedicated two twenty three suppressors and those are going on five five six guns. Mm-hmm. Um, they have muzzle devices that uh, if I were to put that can on the same quick attach, the muzzle devices are de- are designed so that that company's thirty cal can won't accept this 223 suppressor. Oh, okay. Even though they look the same, they mm-hmm. have the same general attachment method, mm-hmm. it won't work. Kind so, of a, a right. built-in but that, safety there. But that's two suppressors out of, you know, uh, potentially like 10 or 11, right? Potentially. So, potentially. Um, you never know. Terrible voting accident. <laughs> uh, but so there's one cool part about, you know, we talk about the compromises, Tragic. and I think, I think a lot of times people think there's there's more to it you know, like I think that it's like, well, there's actually this kind of this, not a formula where you're plugging numbers in, but there's definitely, uh, if, a, if a can has lower volume, it's going to be a little louder. If it's smaller, that means it has lower volume, you know, mm-hmm. both diameter and length. So typically what you're not going to find is you're not going to find a suppressor that's really short and stubby. Um, there's a couple of, you know, there's a couple of uh, suppressors out there that are you know, hearing safe, or maybe they have a certain tone where it maybe it doesn't sound as. Um, I'm thinking of one from like Wyoming Arms. They have a really short five inch suppressor that's actually pretty quiet, but has a lot to do with the type of gun it's designed to use on and stuff like that. So, uh, and how the tone of that suppressor is. But, uh, you know, usually if a can, if you're taking two cans and you're like, you know, the there's a kind of this trend where it's like the full length can and then there's the the S and then there's the K. And so it's like the the regular length, the the mid length, and then you know those cans are internally have very similar design in the baffles, and you know the shorter one's going to have fewer baffles. Uh, that's going to be a little louder. Lighter cans, if you take you know two suppressors, they're the same size, physical size, and one's lighter because it has you know it's either titanium or inconel or some sort of uh, lightweight material. The lighter can's going to heat up faster. Yeah, and and that can be a good thing too because it can cool off faster but it it will heat up faster and so you know suppressor mirage over that suppressor is gonna be apparent in fewer shots oh okay so yeah suppressor mirage that's something we chatted about uh with seth toy over here when we talked Mm -hmm. all about mirage in in one of our podcasts but uh so that would be more prevalent than more likely in a lighter weight can Mm -hmm. Yep. that just kind of i feel like intuitively i can't even put my finger on it like until you explain it but it just sort of would intuitively sort of make sense Mm -hmm. yeah and then you know if you as, as you go up and let's just say you go to a suppressor that you know jim so you're you got this saker right yeah um, and the Saker is, 
it's a 30 cal bore and it's got this um attachment back here where it's your it's your asr or your uh i can never remember the name of their this quick attach method but um if you thread this portion off, right, you take this back half off, you can run in a direct thread adapter. So then this can that has this four ounce or three ounce back half for quick attach, this mechanism that has a bunch of springs and, you know, teeth in it to, to ratchet shut. Well, if you take this mechanism off and you put a direct thread on, we could reduce that weight by a considerable amount. Hmm. For sure. Okay. So that's one of those trade-offs where it's like if you, if you want to add – a quick attach method you can usually assume that's going to be a little heavier i look at i look at a suppressor like this and i you know i could i could go online and i you know if i was going to a silencer dealer or a silencer shop or something like that i could find a, a 30 cal suppressor that has direct thread built into it so we don't have to you know we don't have to adapt something right we don't have to take something out but if cost becomes a factor well, there's another trade-off, right? Like as we start to buy, like you might look at this suppressor and think that's the do-all can. It's got a back half that can be interchanged for quick release or direct thread. It's got interchangeable front caps. Well, this suppressor may be three to $400 more than a suppressor that doesn't have that. So there's mm -hmm. trade-offs and it's not always going to be in performance. It might be in just adding cost to the suppressor. Mm -hmm. I think of a rifle scope like, you know, like the LHT 3-15. to It's like one of my favorite rifle scopes because it has such a wide magnification range, it's got locking turret system, all these things, but you start to bump up the cost as you get to that, right? So there's always yeah. these trade-offs, whether it be a performance, whether it be materials that it's made with, sometimes it's just cost. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to get the best thing that you really always dreamt of, you yep. might just have to pay for it. Yeah, if you think of, you know, again, with rifle scopes, it's like, look at like a 4.5 to 27 Gen 2 or Gen 3, you know, 1 to 10. Those are all going to be optics that are, very capable. They have a wider magnification range or more capabilities, but they also cost more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and then you can look at that too and go, well, what I'm at, what am I using it for? It's like, yeah, that's maybe the best cream of the crop, you know, features out the yin yang, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're not going to be using those features, get the other one. You right. Know? Yeah. Now, I think Ruby, you or Adam mentioned this before. So, uh, in talking about tone and just seeing how a suppressor performs on your gun, because I, I think that, that that is something that is really nice to be able to do if you can. Mm -hmm. Did you say some dealerships will even let you try different suppressors? Oh, I yeah. Know, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Prior to prior to making the whole purchase and that route down that waiting road and tax stamps and yeah. all that, they'll let you try yeah. it out. Yeah, if, if it's a retailer that has a range, yeah. And if so, if they're selling NFA stuff and they have a range, they're generally game for letting you try them. Yeah, that's nice. And do you try that on your firearm then? Or it depends. Depends on. I would on imagine the it's totally dependent. They, upon they usually the have like demo okay. cans, you know that there are that that are theirs. Yeah. Um, you know, it, but yeah, that's that's business specific. Some some might not care. Others. And we're would. also we're also kind of in this market now where there's a YouTube reviewer ten on every product out there. You know, and so you can typically go. And I remember years back there was a suppressor that came onto the market. Um, and it was kind of, it was unique. It was kind of, it was adaptable. You could put a different end cap. You could put a different back end on it. You could direct thread it, quick attach. And it seemed like in social media and reviews and, you know, ads from suppressor dealers, like this was the only suppressor you saw. And it, it was very, very popular for a lot of reasons in that it had a lot of features. It was at a good price. And if you're starting to think to yourself like, wow, you know, I've seen that XYZ suppressor all over the place and guys are posting it you know, with pictures of hunting and, you know, I've seen guys shoot matches with it or, you know, sniper comps or whatever. There's a good chance that that suppressor is all over the place because it has a good reputation. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, this is something where it's not like if you don't like it, you sell it because yeah. you can't really do that. So if you see people that are really happy with a suppressor and they're talking about it, you know, it's a, it's a buy once you're stuck with it forever type of product so yeah there's a good chance that there's a reason why people say good things about something yeah if you can do it in person it's always better though it's kind of like any anything that revolves around your senses which i guess basically is sort of everything that we end up buying ultimately but it's never you can never really tell if you try and watch it online and i'm yeah. thinking of 
you see somebody shoot with a suppressor online or on Instagram or whatever, you watch a video of it and you're like, oh, that seemed pretty quiet because yeah. you're watching it on your phone, which is playing it at hearing safe volumes regardless of what you're watching. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> None yeah, of yeah, these you know, gunshots oh, are loud. Why do we even need suppressors? Exactly. And uh, it, it reminds me of like people who buy exhausts for their cars based on all the YouTube videos they watched and then they get it and it sounds, it never sounds anything like what it does in the YouTube yeah. video. Like, it, they never quite do it justice. So if you can do it in person, I feel like that'd be oh, pretty yeah. I was I was, I guess, more so just saying like if you see someone and you see something repeatedly like right. all the I time, got, there's a good chance at. that it's probably mm-hmm. a good product. Like, Yeah. It's unlike pretty much any other consumer product. Yeah. yeah. In that like a company can't just send it to an influencer and they're going <laughs> to be like, oh, yeah, they're going to do their thing with it and they're going to send it back. No. Like if you see a suppressor review, that person either bought it or they're associated with somebody they have they're an employee of a company or they're an employee of a company yeah yeah so i don't know i would say that uh getting hands-on time with it is obviously the best thing that you can do but you can also you know get a lot of a lot of uh information about a suppressor by simply looking at it by you know evaluating okay like i've shot you know this 30 cal suppressor that was nine inches long and you know inch and a half diameter and it sounded kind of like this and this is made of the same materials you're kind of starting to look at, you know, there's there's a lot of similarities between a lot of suppressors. There's some differences, you know, whether it be attachment method or the material that they're coating it with or, or you know. Or the design of the Is it baffles. a monocore? Is it a you know, K-baffle system? So, yeah, there there's a lot of similarities, but there's fewer differences. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If we got to well, we gotta get into the, the pistol and the rimfire stuff, too, but I feel like, Marco, the... the I went at it. I remember when I was getting suppressors, I did get multiple. I, I was looking at, there was a couple that were supposed to be the do all, but then I got, I ultimately got a couple. I went for like, there's the, um, long, I have a long, really, but pretty lightweight 30 cal hunting can. Mm-hmm. That's more design. It's not, it's not full auto rated cause I'm not going to be sending a lot of shots through it. And then there's, the Saker, the 308, but like when you look at this thing, it's not bad in size overall, but it's portly. She's thick. It's portly. Like it weighs, oh, yeah. it you weighs could, a lot. You can club a fish with that. Can, yeah. I, can I say one thing? Like before we close out that thought on like centerfire rifle cans, mm-hmm. I think it's okay to say, you know, I'm going to buy the suppressor and I want to use it on a handful of rifles. And so like... So instead of buying a 223 bore, you buy a 30 cal bore because you want to shoot it on a 6.5 and on a 300 Win Mag and, you know, a few different rifles. The one thing I don't suggest doing is, like, thinking to yourself, well, I'm buying my first suppressor and I want to make sure that I get one that's going to cover all my needs. Don't go out and buy, like, a 46 cal bore because someday you might get a tactical <laughs> lever action, you know, 45 long Colt and you want to shoot subsonics out of it. Like... If you do buy that gun someday, buy a suppressor for that gun. Because that big of a difference, you know, going from a 30 cal bore to a 46 cal bore, I mean, you know, it's like set a 416 Barrett and a 223 next to each other and tell me that that suppressor is going to be just as good on both. I mean, you can see by the physical size differences in, in the rounds that it's not the same forces that are ha- you know happening through as that goes through that suppressor so just sounds like it's going to be impractical yeah and i think more often than not when people try and like buy a one size fits all product you end up using it for the thing that you thought you were going to use it for most often and you really don't you, you know you would never buy something for the 10 percent, you know buy it for the 90 percent. yeah i mean it's probably you know just another good spot to do the uh the old 80 20 you know and yeah very much so and the same thing along those lines with kind of some of the dual cans or the very modular cans in in rifles anyway these cans that get very hot and very you know there's a lot of heat cycles and things like that you, it, they are modular to an extent but at some point, you are going to be committed to a configuration because they're going to start to seize together. So, oh, yeah, that's right. So at some point, you're going to not be able to get that adapter off the back or that adapter off the front. Or if you can, it's going to take effort and a vice. That's just because of all the carbon building? Yeah, just carbon and heat cycles and, you know, I mean, some of it's soft metal that it's made out of, you know, so it just starts to... It yeah. just starts to bind together and carbon together, and and so like like 
that well that the first can that I bought's a good example. Like I mean, it's kind of it kind of is what it is now because <laughs> I can't really get it apart anymore yeah. without being violent. Now, if you have to get violent, it's a hollow tube. Like you can only get it so tight in a vice. Yeah. Right before you start to crush it. So I did a seven year stint in the fasten- fastener world, and I when I bought my first suppressor, I was like, I I got this anti seize. I'll you know, I'll clean it once in a while. Um, yeah, that that lasted uh, a yeah. couple thousand rounds. You know, so it's like yeah, you are gonna get to a point where things are gonna start to seize up. You don't necessarily need to clean a suppressor more than once every. I mean, I would just say don't clean center fire rifle suppressors unless you're shooting cast lead bullets. Hmm. And even some of them, like, you can't take them apart enough to do that because they either have a sealed end cap or a sealed back half or something like that. So you, even if you want to clean a suppressor, sometimes you really can't. Mm-hmm. So I would I would almost say, like, don't plan to clean your center fire suppressor one one industry guy that works at a suppressor company one time told me like if you really really want to do it like take a couple of 30 round mags and heat it up like run them through the gun as fast as you can hmm. heat it up and you know a lot of that stuff will burn out i was gonna say you're, you're, yeah, you're mm-hmm. burning that stuff who's off, doing man. that today's ammo prices right like that's that's pretty costly yeah yeah so they they effectively almost self-maintain it's very much like an oven I yep. mean, especially on the rifle cans, they get hot enough that they take care of themselves. Yeah. And rimfire cans to are a total, totally different totally animal, different. right? Yep. Because right. we're most of the time shooting rimfire ammo that's not plated or jacketed. It's it's sometimes coated, so it mm-hmm. can be a wax coating or it can be, you know, you could be shooting um, like a copper plated bullet where it's, you know, it's a very, very thin lubricating coating of, of uh of copper or something like that you know th- but but a lot of times it's just a cast bullet it's just a non-coated lead bullet yeah it might have wax or something but that that's depositing lead now every time it goes through your suppressor and the exhaust you know the gases are dirtier too so that's coating and caking the inside of your suppressor so those so those wind up needing to be maintained yeah and that's and you know, that's a tricky thing too because you can go and you can do like you know, put in a sonic cleaner and run it for a while oh. as long as the, the, you know, your sleeve uh, or your, your outside jacket can handle the, the s- substances that are in a sonic cleaner. Um, but there's also, you know, chemical ways that you can do a mixture of, you know, this and this, but then you're led with, you're left with lead acetate, which you can't pour that down your drain. You can't pour it in your yard. It has to go to hazardous material dump like your county dump or your township dump or something like that. That's such a pain dealing with all that stuff. Yeah, and then and that that actually soaks into your skin too. So it's actually a really, really nasty process for you to even do. So, you know, I, I tell people like get a screwdriver and get that stuff out of there because it's, if it's not in a gaseous or liquid form, it's going to be a lot less damaging. And Put some rubber gloves on and scrape it off. But And you're not going to damage it too ish? Maybe, maybe not. It's It's... The risk you run. So those well, are just what, a little bit trickier, huh? The, yeah. the yeah. rimfire suppressors. What really sells rimfire suppressors is how do they come apart and yeah. how do you clean them? Yeah. Okay. And, like and when if you shoot have it too much, com- how yeah. easy is it to get apart after I ran in a couple thousand yeah. rounds? When people spread them out on the counter, like that's one of the main conversations is how does it come apart? Yeah. In the, you know, is it a stack of is it a stack of things that go together in a sleeve? Is it a monocore that comes out? What's well, it made since, out of? since since we kind of jumped yeah. into this rimfire cans, do you want to kind of go through that too? Yeah, why not? I, I might wish- circle back because I do, I do. Well, maybe I have just more general suppressor questions, but it's definitely more on on the rifle side. Why not? I yeah, man, this is where talking about rimfire suppressors though. This is where I wish that there wasn't like all these waiting times and tax stamps and crap. They almost just seem like they should be disposable. They really I, should. I actually, you know, <laughs> this is there's always this thing that you hear when you talk about suppressors with your, you know, your uncles and your cousins and the group of people at the gun club. It's like, oh yeah, well in Europe they're just ten bucks and you buy them at like I don't know that they're that cheap, but um, there are there are um, in America and I will say this like I know this to be true in America suppressors are typically overbuilt. They're very much built to endure a lifetime of use because this tax stamp is with you forever, right? So even if you want it, the only way to get rid of it is to bring it to the ATF and 
here you go. I don't want this anymore. You can't sell it. You can't transfer it to a dealer. So here, suppressors are are built to last. Um, there are other countries where a, a suppressor might be, you, the gun might take you six months or a year to get it, but the suppressor's like, yeah, go down to your local hardware hank and, and get a suppressor. And I have heard from people that I know in those countries that a suppressor, where here we might spend $800 on a titanium core, 30 caliber direct threat suppressor, that might be a $250 or $300 suppressor. Wow. But when when it's done, it's done. And you I get a new I one. I can't say which I prefer. I, I, Actually, I think you, I know. You kind of wish, well, like, I, I don't. But well, I, yeah. no, I do know, but I don't like it. I, yeah. I kind of wish that. Well, especially you, Mark. You like really nice stuff. I mean, I wish there was well, no tax stamp for any of them. Right, like I wish there was no waiting period for any. It would be nice if you could just say, oh, "I want to buy a cheaper suppressor because I'm only going to use it on my, you know." I mean, yeah. for me, three hundred dollar like, gear I f- rifle once I, a year. I, 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 I don't want to get. I flew into my hunt this time. I'm just going to go by the hardware store and get a suppressor, and I don't need the most expensive one. Yeah, I'll just gra- grab so, a cheap one. So what you can do yeah, is like, nice. I guess the the tax stamp right is that thing that right now it's our reality that it's here. We have to deal with it. It's that's part of the process. There are lower cost suppressors. Um, I was looking at uh, Wit Machine, and I want to say under four hundred dollars, you can buy a little four inch thirty caliber suppressor. You, you still have to pay the tax stamp, right? So mm-hmm. now it's a six hundred dollar suppressor, but it, I think it's under four hundred dollars, and that that's probably not. I don't know. I haven't used it, but to my knowledge, I would imagine there's less material. Maybe maybe less machining or less you know something with it that makes it that cost, but you can buy lower cost suppressors, but it's not a throw it away item when you're done. And it's only four inches, so I'm sure it doesn't. Add Sound suppression is probably pretty minimal. Yeah. yeah, but but nonetheless, like you know, there are when we look at rimfire suppressors and and I guess any suppressors that can be taken apart, there is a serialized part, right? Mm-hmm. And okay. then there are non serialized parts. Uh, my experience is that a lot of rimfire suppressors, the, the little baffles, if you can take them out, that's not the that's not the serialized part. So if you did run oh. into a case where, hey, they're they're trashed, or I did something, I was cleaning it and I dented it with my screwdriver, you could order those replacement parts. That's that's nice. Okay. Mo, mo, I, I would say a lot of reputable suppressor manufacturer companies are have an eye towards. The, the registered part mm-hmm. is something that could be record or is yeah. just a sleeve or something like that. So they can this part. adapt your product. Like so. on this Osprey right here, that's, that's this part right here. Mm-hmm. That's the, that's not this sleeve. That's not your baffles. That's sure. this, this rear half. That's actually, you can tell it's the more rigid part of the construction. It's, it's not, the part not that our scopes stand yeah. the test of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like on our scopes, as long as the tube is okay, I mean, our techs can pretty much fix anything else right. in that scope. Yeah. As long as the tube's okay. But if they get it in and then the tube's yeah. bent, they're like, well, you know, that's kind of right. You know, Goose is mine cooked it, on that. Mine one. it for good parts and yeah, put them in a new tube. Is there something about, still speaking on rimfire cans, is there something about them otherwise that's different than a center fire can? Like, it, it, like the internal baffle material and structure? Yeah, yeah m- material and construction. Some of them are rated for higher calibers, so some yeah. of them are some of them are really chasing lightweight, you know, on on 22 long rifle specifically. Some are pretty much 22 long rifle cans, but they're rated for the pressures of 17 HMR and um, um, what's the, the trend right now? The, is one? the trend right now is... Get, Rimfire cans that are five seven by two eight rated. Yeah, or yeah, four, that one. Four point six by thirty. The the HK uh, MP seven cartridge. Who has hmm. one of those? I don't know, but, but that's he's the, out there and he <laughs> wants a can for it. <laughs> but that's the. I mean, like our our, our buddies at Amtax suppressors. A few years. Do you remember that that oh, yeah. commercial they did where it was like they got a question that where someone was like, "Is is uh, your twenty two suppressor full auto rated?" And they threaded it onto an AR and shot it, and like five rounds into the, <laughs> the full auto burst. It just, popped and they looked at the camera and they're like nope (laughs) so but i think i think uh with rimfire suppressors you know my experience with them is you know typically you're going to find them they're they're modular they can be taken apart you know there's a trend right now where you can get a suppressor that has additional baffles so you can get more volume or something like that right longer shorter yeah yeah like the Mm -hmm. erector set like you can just keep threading on baffles that that uh that q suppressor um Mm -hmm. like sunshades 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but but the other thing is, you notice a lot of uh, coatings. So there's some there's kind of some new coatings that are being used on the baffles that you know I, I would imagine they're using so that lead and and the, the deposited exhaust doesn't stick to them as well, or so that you might be able to clean them easier. Sure. But uh, yeah, I mean you, you're gonna see more aluminum used in rimfire suppressors typically because they're they're it's lighter, it's you know less cost. Uh, easier to machine stuff like that, so you do see a lot less steel. Maybe maybe the nut that threads onto the barrel, but you know the sleeve or or the baffles. A lot a lot of aluminum, a lot of titanium, some ink and L. But more often than not, you'd see these rimfire suppressors. Like the standard is kind of like three and a half to four and a half inches, about an inch or so in diameter, and made of a lightweight material. Where these cans are, you know, three to five ounces, something like that. Okay. Yeah, I feel like with a rimfire suppressor too. The stakes aren't as high, yeah, because you're oh, yeah. suppressing something that's like, especially if you're yeah. shooting twenty two long rifle. I mean, you're, you're you're shooting something that's pretty borderline hearing safe to begin with, and then yep. if you stick something on the end of it, you know, as long as like you said, that's probably why most people are concerned with, you know, well, how do I clean it? You know, more of the more of the down and dirty maintenance type stuff because mm-hmm. you're like, I'm sure it's going to make this thing hearing safe. Your decibel yeah. rating on a rimfire can it doesn't have a lot of work to do, so that's why the volume is smaller. But also, I mean, that you they just they make you giggle when like yeah that's how loud it is, uh, especially on a bolt action or something where you can keep the action closed. Um, that it's like like that like it's like the sound of the hammer dropping is the sound of the can a lot of times. That's Literally, so awesome. um, you get into rimfire pistols, it can be a little louder. But a lot of times, if you shoot standard velocity ammo out of a standard length barrel, you know, ten twenty two or bolt action, you know, rifle. That powder is all burned before that bullet exits. So you're not dealing with a lot of, you know, unburnt powder that pop. You're dealing with just that that supersonic crack mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and a little bit of pressure behind the bullet. How about pistol cans while we're making our way through? And then Mark has his general suppressor questions. But how about these? So we have, like, uh, like we mentioned earlier, we have an Osprey here, which is actually kind of a unique one. This isn't, like, a super common pistol can oh, unless i haven't it's a very successful can right mm-hmm. unless uh well but it's not like your typical just cylinder you correct know? yes um so it's a super cool one uh that i actually got a while back i see what i was saying a while back is i was saying my my approach to it was to get like one can for each use i wasn't actually even seeing guns so much as like i knew i wanted a hunting can a can that could go on ARs, a kind of do-it-all can just in case to mop up the rest, <laughs> and then a rimfire can and a pistol can. And I was like, if I have those, would I make that five? I should be pretty good for anything, unless I, I'm the guy who goes out and gets the lever action, some big 40-something cal, whatever. And then Fun. I, not you know, entirely cool, practical. But, you know, unless I go out and that do something super crazy. That actually strikes crazy. something you yeah. would do, Jim. By the way, <laughs> how, how come you don't have that yet? <laughs> good, good question. Uh, unless I do something super crazy, I was pretty much covered across the board. Um, and so anyways, that's, that's what we have here. Funny enough, like you guys were talking about, the one that I got as my catch-all, do-all can or whatever was the Saker 762. Because I was like, oh, yeah, I can just kind of like, yeah, switch out the back half, switch out stuff, plop it on anything. It's the one that has been used the least. Right. Um, that but, is interesting. But anyway, I did get this thing, though, to go on pistols. And pistol suppressors, I remember all my other ones I got, and it was kind of like, well, this is easy. You get the suppressor, you get, if it needs it, a muzzle brake to go on the gun. You're going to put it on, and then you just kind of, like, put it on. Pistol suppressors were a little weird. This one fi- took me a little bit of, like, asking people questions and trying to make sure that I was getting the right parts to actually make it work with my pistol. Most of it had to come down to... I didn't realize you don't just direct thread it on and go necessarily out of the box. Like there's little things like this uh, booster. Or what did you call it earlier, uh, Rube? Uh, Nielsen, Nielsen device. Nielsen, Nielsen device. device or stuff like that. Maybe you guys. Why don't you guys just jump into pistol suppressors though? I'll say a couple things and then pass it over to you because you've sold a lot more of them than I have, right? So I will say that I think when you ask somebody about suppressors, probably the first thing that comes to their mind is, yeah, it's like an assassin's tool right you see it on pistols in james bond like it's a it's a movie suppressor is almost always on a pistol maybe a sniper rifle here and there but like it's typically portrayed as like you, you thread it on right well they're really hard to holster and they get yes. hot so when you reholster yes. them they either melt your holster or they burn through your pants and burn your leg so 
Pistols, that's all, I mean, that's just problematic when you're trying to be like a super cool assassin. Yeah. Pistol suppressors uh, are the are the suppressors that I think you see the least. But in I, real life. But my first suppressor was a pistol suppressor. Like, and now I thread it on a PCC because it's, oh, I actually mm-hmm. use it more often. But like you mentioned, I mean, you have to have, uh, some in some applications, not all of them, but on like a falling block, like on a Glock where the barrel unlocks and drops down to come out a battery to start your kind of your ejection and your, your site, your, uh, slide cycling process. Well, that, that Nielsen's device or that booster is like a spring piston inside so that when that barrel does unlock, this will actually pull out a little bit to follow the barrel Hmm. because that barrel is pulling back. So it doesn't put as much up stress or down stress on the barrel when the barrel unlocks and then locks. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it adds life to the suppressor and it doesn't wear out your threads as fast, but but yeah, I mean, I think pistol suppressors are probably like you think of it first when you think of suppressors, but then you use it the least. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've used mine exactly three times in four years, probably. Yeah, five years. Well, and like you said, in the movies too, it's like always like in the moment they're like, "Oh, time to go do yeah. work," you know. Time and to they go dark. <laughs> <laughs> thread it right on. Yeah, but in the uh, in the movies, they're going back to that whole disposable sort of nature that we were talking about earlier, right? Because you go do whatever clandestine operation you got to do, and then you, like, uh, throw it in a river or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you don't need to worry not about it. Today, not in the river will cool it down. Uh, uh, seven, exactly. Seven years of waiting in the river. I got this one, though. I remember when I was looking around at pistol suppressors because I believe, is this the one where you could also uh, pop it on, like, a 300 blackout or something? I think it will do 300 blackout subsonic pressures. Subsonic. Yeah. Okay. Got it. The yeah, Adam, thing, what you got on Well, the big thing on this one is that the for those watching on YouTube, the bore is offset to the can. So when you thread a big expansion chamber on the front of a pistol, all of a sudden you couldn't see over your sights. Right. So one of the thoughts behind this one is they offset the bore so that it has a large volume underneath, oh. but you had more clearance for your sights. Yeah. Which is why this particular can was very popular in the pistol suppressor world. Hence the reason why there is a term suppressor height sights. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Super tall sights to get over that big can. Yep. Yeah. And you look at a lot of, I mean, a lot of the guns that we were kind of exposed to that had suppressors on them were like, you know, like a, like a Mark 23, right? Like mm-hmm. HK, um, big 45 uh, polymer frame gun, but with a big old suppressor on there, they were shooting you know, 230 hardball or something like yeah. that. And the it's, direct it's action pistol. Pretty, pretty sweet, like, video game pistol, and then you shoot it in real life, and you're kind of like, yeah, once I is really, enough. I really want a <laughs> stock and a foregrip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get a UMP. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I think a lot of times they're, they're, you don't just take the same rifle can and thread it on a pistol with a thread adapter, right? Yeah. Because our bore on a 9 mil is like a 9 or a 355 bore. So looking at like that, like a like a hybrid 46 or something where that's a 46 cowboy, you might be able to take that suppressor and okay, put a booster in it and now shoot it on your Glock, but now it's not really it's not really optimized for anything. It just kind of does everything. Yeah. Yep. Um and then I'll like, just say yes on that part. <laughs> and then it comes back to like I mean pistols are shooting slow moving bullets with slow burning dirty powder so they usually have to be cleaned they don't get very hot compared to rifle cans still don't touch them after you're done shooting but um they don't get hot enough to clean themselves um so so that you know serviceability is usually a thing um and then i think the other thing and maybe you got exposed this a little bit is uh all threaded barrels for whatever pistol you might be trying to go to are like all over the map so like there are all kinds of thread adapters yes you yes. gotta be sure yeah, you have the true. right one i couldn't figure that was what got me because I, I i think i yeah. had four yeah and I, I was does I mean, this one it, work no does you know, anything german seems to be left hand thread yep. um 45 versus nine mil it's all it's all over the place yeah we're not trying to scare people out of buying mm-hmm. a pistol suppressor by any means no. i mean it's just it is one of those things where it's I think you'd be pretty pretty confident if you walked into a dealer and you're like, "Hey, I want to buy that X rifle. It's got, you know, this threaded barrel. I need a suppressor for it." And there's a pretty good chance that whatever press suppressor you pick for that, it's like as long as it threads up and the bore is bigger than the bullet you're shooting, mm-hmm. 
it's going to work. Yeah. Uh, pistols, there's a little more to, to know, right? Like yeah. a little mm. bit more homework to go with. Yeah. yeah. But to be to be terribly honest, just because just that's how we are, like, I mean, pistols are a big part of my life and yours as well. I would say we probably shoot more pistol rounds a year than anything else. Mm-hmm. Don't have one of these. I haven't shot a suppressor on my pistol in at least yep. three years. Hmm. Yep. No boating accidents or anything. Just don't. Just don't have one. Yeah. You know <laughs> because I mean it's not very. Appli- I mean you can't use it for it, eat. You know daily carry. You know concealed carry needs not apply. Yeah. Um, action shooting sports needs not apply. You know so it's very it's very uh it's very kind of you know they're good for plinking and there's sure. there's all kinds of purposes for them. but like outside of, most people who shoot pistols a lot don't have an application for this yeah in the way yeah. I mean, that you could we use rifle suppressors you could kind of yeah. you could kind of almost say too like in the competitive shooting action shooting world for pistols there's really no place for suppressors cuz they yeah. add size and weight yep uh, mm-hmm. and it and it's it's just a little well mm-hmm. you're even talking about just the cumbersome nature of holstering or something like that mm-hmm. i'm trying to picture like okay well how do i you know, if you're going to carry or something mm-hmm. like that, like it becomes no, yeah. you get the right combination though. Like it, there's like Brota M nine eighty three or something, yeah. and, and you thread a suppressor on there. That's cool. Like it's yeah. it's a cool gun to shoot. That is. It's it's not as cool when you have to holster it, but you know, standing. At, uh, I mean, Doesn't I remember matter. one time we were back out out at the farm and we were shooting pistols with suppressors on. That's it's fun. Like yeah. it's yeah. a ton of fun. Yeah, might not be as practical, but it's fun. Pistols are very suppressible because yeah. the bullets are at or near, mm. the, you yeah. know, yeah. Son- yeah. supersonic speed. Yep. Um, now, pistol caliber suppressors. When you get into sub guns, game changer. Like that, like that uh, Kalashnikov that you have. Mm. You know that thing. Super fun with Say the camera. No um, yeah, that is a good MP5. Perfect example. And then like you don't have to worry. Then you don't have to worry about the boosters and all that stuff. No, mm-hmm. you can yep. just get whatever nope. adapters just thread that bad boy yeah. on there. Not a reciprocating barrel of any type. Like the barrel is fixed, so you're not worried about that. That can you know being jolted up or jolted down or back. Mm-hmm. Like that Nielsen device isn't needed. Yeah. So yeah. the other thing that Nielsen device is probably anywhere from one to three ounces. So you're adding weight to, oh, and you sure. can take that off. Um, one of uh, one of the cans that I've used for a long time is a Omega Nine K. That was like one of the first suppressors I I bought, and that has you know I can I can thread the back end off and put a quick attach on. So if I want to run it on sub guns, I can do that. If I want to put a Nielsen device in, I can run it on a pistol. It's a very versatile can. It's kind of one of those suppressors I think is actually kind of an outlier. It's one of the suppressors that you can put on a lot of different things. It's mm-hmm. it's yeah, and that one that one in particular was so good and so successful so versatile that a lot of other companies had to come out with their version yep. of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So solid buy. Yeah. If, if you're a person, you know, that you're like, oh, man, I really like to shoot a lot. Maybe I like, you know, I really like ARs. Maybe you're doing a variety of things. Um, but you're like, I just want it to be quiet. Like, is, is a PCC, is a suppressed PCC, is that, like, a great way to go? Like, you can, if, like, if you're high chasing, volume. If you're chasing quiet, again, it's kind of like, well, what are you trying to do with the gun, you know? Right. So, like, if you don't need sp- something specific terminal ballistics-wise from mm-hmm. a gun, yeah, I mean, PCCs are probably some of the most suppressible guns there are. You're because gonna, they're working on a blowback, so there's no... There's no porting of gases pretty much until the bolt the bullet is gone. You can get a little more port, port crack in in a gun. You know, port crack just being um, on a direct blowback action. You know, think mm-hmm. of like a Ruger PC carbine or a nine millimeter AR or something like mm-hmm. that, where there's no locking mechanism on the bolt. As soon as that um, bullet fires, the bullet's moving forward, but that kind of equal and opposite reaction, the bolt's moving backwards at the mm-hmm. same time. So some of that unburnt powder can come as soon as that um, that bolt opens enough. Oh. You can, you mm-hmm. know, the bolt theoretically is open as the bullet's leaving. So some of that unburnt gas comes back through the port. That's called port crack. Okay. Uh, and you can have a little higher likelihood of that with some of those guns, but, you know, in something with a locking design like an MP5 or, yeah. um, you know, like a CMMG, uh, banshee i believe mm-hmm. um where they do have like some sort of locking mechanism yeah stupid quiet yeah hmm. so so some it just guns, sounds fun and yeah. pleasant i mean mark though like speaking of ars and stuff i mean you heard my ar that we had on that coyote hunt mm-hmm. i mean that thing was i i don't know if part of the reason was just because of the heightened awareness of the fact that there is a coyote that popped up there but i mean almost 
I didn't even notice it. Well, I mean, it went off. you know, I mean, we recorded that, and like, it's not like, bam, you know, no. And and getting back to you know, you're like, oh, Mark, you're thinking about a suppressor. We were in that scenario. I, I knew Jim had a suppressor, and I had that uh, six five Creed with the uh, the big break on the end. Yes, and the big shouty thing. And I love shooting things. I love hunting. I love coyote hunting. I w- I'm there like, man, I hope. Um, I hope Jim gets a shot because I, I didn't want to, you know what I mean? Like I even had, uh, you know, hearing protection in, but I, it was just going to be louder and pleasant. Like I said, I've been trying to be better about protecting my ears. Well, um, and you not had all to, the time. You had to have hearing protection in, which sucked. I mean, because right. you, know, you were trying to hear, at, at first we were trying to hear like, do, do, do we get the Fox Pro working up and, you know, or yeah. whatever? And you got to pull that out. And they're like, oh, I got to put it back in because the coyotes might be coming. But then you're trying to, we're trying to communicate. So you got to pull it out again and yep. hear whatever somebody else is saying. Put it back in in case you got to yep. take a shot. And, well, and then it forces- the whole time I was just there like, ready when they are. But then it's like, then it, it forces you, you know, here you are being a responsible citizen with a suppressor, <laughs> but then I'm not. And, like, it forces you to probably have hearing protection or, you know, make some sort of compromises or, I don't know. Well, you talked about this in the last Why Suppressed episode, but I I haven't hunted, with the exception of shotgun, you know, bird hunting, Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't hunted without a suppressor in six years. Yeah. Uh, Likewise. And, and, and like, I, I just, I won't go back. Like, unless there's some law that says I can't have it in a certain state to hunt with, I won't, I won't not have one. And I, I think, um, you know, a few years ago, I kind of, bit on that uh suppressed muzzle loader thing right <laughs> and so like even went as far as like yeah i'm gonna get a suppressed muzzle loader because that actually because didn't you could. require a tax stamp that was a moderator right so it's threaded on a gun uh it's threaded on a muzzle loader that wasn't classified by the atf as a firearm so it's not a firearm accessory so that was just part of the gun and um well i haven't hunted with it as much it's like that was put kind of part of like my mental like dedication to suppressed hunting was that yeah I'm, I'm, if yeah. i'm hunting like i'm hunting suppressed it's so much nicer oh, not to get amazing. it you know you could like i could beat this dead horse all day but like just from like a practicality standpoint i feel like it's somebody like saying like oh you want hearing protection well that's gonna be a problem that could be dangerous <laughs> uh <laughs> and i actually you know what's funny is this is uh this is a stat that i heard the other day too the average 223 ar with a 16 inch barrel and a suppressor the sound of the gun is actually a little bit it's like one decibel above a jackhammer hmm. so like with a typical yeah. 223 suppressor with a suppressor it's still as loud as a jackhammer. So Which, the, what? There's probably God. OSHA laws that say you have to yeah. wear hearing protection when you're yeah. using it. Yeah. So, so you get fined if you don't use it there, and you get fined if you use it illegally. Maybe here. that's our answer. Somehow we should petition OSHA into saying that suppressors are mandatory. I think the the Hearing Protection Act that was kind of pushed a few years ago that you know that was the main reasoning was that like Americans deserve the right to protect their hearing. Yeah. Um. For sure. Mark, getting back to like which yeah. suppressor to pick, though, I'm get what it, what else is there in your mind as a as a suppressor shopper? What are you looking at? Obviously, there's all these different kinds, like we said before. I mean, essentially, what it boils down to is a lot of what do you want to use it for, and yeah. then in that case, then would that require a a uh, maximum maximum suppression, or would it require super light and handy and small or I mean, what? Where, so, where so are you I mean, at? For me, you know, you know, maybe the best of both worlds, right? But as much as that exists, but you know, and you brought up earlier, Jim, like ah, you know, one or two. Like I think I could realistically get by with two. I think I'd want a thirty cal, and I'd want one for my five five six, and that's going to cover Which the Mark, guns. Mark has now. My that well, theori- theoretically, you know, I mean. Oh, the, yeah, the undocumented sorry. boating, boating accident. Boating accident. Sorry, so, yeah, if, yeah. It, if I had to make really a suggestion. To build a better boat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the answer here. <laughs> Fool uh, me once. Uh. <laughs> How many is that now? Four? <laughs> <laughs> if I had to make a suggestion to what I would call the rational consumer of gun owners who, you know, might have an AR. Who's, you know, Mark, you're part of that group now. Um, they've got a rimfire, a couple ARs, mm-hmm. some hunting bolt guns, right? My thing would be like, get a direct thread thirty caliber suppressor first. Mm-hmm. That's my thing. Like that's just my. This is my suggestion. Get a direct thread thirty cal suppressor, something fairly lightweight, something not too cumbersome. Yep. That you've got a few rifles that have 
you know, that are threaded for that same diameter, you can thread them on and off. Then get a rimfire suppressor. Okay, like rimfire suppressors are the f- most fun of any suppressor you can get. Like uh, pistol suppressors are fun, but rimfire, that's just stupid quiet. It's so much fun. And then go and get, you know, uh, a suppressor with some sort, of, some sort of quick attach method for your ARs that, you know, mm-hmm. if you needed to, you could put on, you know, uh, another type of gun too. You yeah. know, you can add muzzle devices and quickly switch. But the thing that's hard for me is to recommend like a, a one size fits all suppressor because, uh, you know, even if you look at this one, you've got these, uh, you need a spanner wrench to take these two, uh, mm-hmm. this end cap off the back, right? I've got a couple of suppressors that do that. And, you know, once you do that 10 to 15 times, all of a sudden it starts getting marred up and you get, yeah. you know, and like if you didn't get a good purchase on it when you did it, you kind of start to strip out some of those teeth. And like I've gotten to the point now where even the suppressors I have that I could switch between multiple guns, I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to leave that one that way and save up for a different suppressor if I truly actually need one. I mean, yeah. it's kind—it's of, almost like we keep bringing them rifle scope analogies, but like you know, it's like oh, you get a rifle scope, you top it with something. Sure, I could put it on a hundred different guns if I wanted, right? But it's sighted in, it's there, it's mounted, it's working properly. Yeah. I like it, you know, and 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 so I mean, and that is kind of how I view a suppressor. Like, I'd actually like to build uh, a new 300 short mag, 300 WSM gem. And uh, you've gone full WSM. I have, but <laughs> I'm sensitive to the the backlash. That, hey, Texas, you win. You did it. Uh, don't don't cave to them. Hey, hey, hey easy, easy. Credit easy. where credits due. They're gonna uh, be mansplaining st- winter to us for like ten years. I'll now. still <laughs> <laughs> I'll still be wisdom over here. We'll we'll even each well, other out. Exactly. I'll, I'll stand with Jim. The yin the yin and yang. Um, but I actually kind of want to build a gun for that probably a little bit shorter barrel to accommodate the fact that I'm going to be, you know, essentially lengthening the firearm with yeah. the with the suppressor. And I put a premium on uh weight. I want to keep it as lightweight as possible and quiet. I don't like you said, I don't care about full auto. I don't care about like some wild, you know, rating, a decibel rating, like, you know, so I want a lighter weight suppressor and I want it to be quiet and and that actually is a question that I had cuz I was actually talking to somebody about suppressors the other day. And I was like, oh, Look what about this one? What about this one? And they're like, well, that's a good one. But those guys actually don't place a precedence on, or as much a precedence maybe compared to some other ones, on the uh, on the sound suppression. And like in my head, I was like, what? I thought that's like the main thing that these were for. So I guess that's my, my question. Like, They're not when, chasing decibels is probably what he meant. They're not chasing decibels, yeah. But like, frankly, I think I'm, or maybe I don't. But I feel like I want the one that's chasing decibels because, well, like, the, particularly for like a first round up- pop. You know, you hear about first round pop. We've mm-hmm. talked about that before. Well, hopefully, I'm only firing one shot in this scenario, so I actually care about the one that's going to be the most quiet on the first round. Here's, here's so, something to keep in mind: if you're concerned about first round pop, and this is kind of actually a little bit more of a universal suppressor kind of. Uh, I don't know what I would say. It's it's a truth, I guess. It's it's an accepted fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, typically suppressors that have like a, a K baffle system or something where they have these baffles that are welded together, you know, um, they will have a lower reduced first round pop than something that's a mono core suppressor. So okay. that's, that's two different types of suppressors. One that has, you know, these baffles that are in, inserted in, into a tube or they're welded together to create a baffle stack. You, you've got suppressors too, like a lot of pistol suppressors like this Osprey, I believe would be actually like a monocore. So they're taking a piece of material machining out monocore suppressors typically will have more first round pop. Gotcha. So if you're, Mm. if you are going for that sound suppression on your first round, maybe think of a, you know, typical, uh, like a, a baffle stack type suppressor. Gotcha. And is that, that's something that would be common for like a 30 cal direct thread type suppressor? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And they may, they may have good first round pop numbers but you know oh you know running a full um uh sound protocol on them the like signature profile. of that yeah that that signature of that can might not be good over the span of 10 shots or 20 shots but it has a really good first round pop hmm. and i think the other thing maybe i'm not sure who you're who that manufacturer was but some some of them also when they say like well we're not chasing decibels what else could they be chasing they could be trying to hit a range of suppression and when they're inside of that they're looking at other characteristics and, and i know some of those companies that are making 
cans that are targeted towards rifles like you're talking about, they want things like um, accuracy sure. of the rifle or repeatability of zero when you attach and detach oh, the yeah. suppressor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're starting to look at things like that. It's like, okay, we checked the box. We got the reduction we want. Now we need a can that has less than a half a minute shift when we take it on and take it off. Yep. Or, you know, we need a can that has, you know, it doesn't increase or decrease, you know, the groups of a rifle by an appreciable amount. Okay. So there's more to suppressors than just how Mm -hmm. many decibels does it reduce? Yeah, there could be a suppressor that, you know, makes... I think a lot of this has to do with like how much it's dampening your barrel or if you're, you know, the, the load that you're shooting, if it's in a certain node and then you put something out on the end of the gun, it can change that node mm-hmm. due sure. to harmonics, like a, right? Like a barrel weight. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tuner, right? So it's, uh, you're adding this dampener or this thing that's changing the harmonics of the barrel. So like some suppressors will claim that they have no appreciable shift where your zero moves from here to here. Mm-hmm. And then there's suppressors that claim that they don't change your accuracy. So they say your group won't open up, right? Or, but it may shift. But it might shift. Right. So what are we chasing? So, uh, you know, a guy that's, uh, you know, a SOCOM operator might have a huge uh, desire to not have a zero shift when he takes a suppressor on and off. But the accuracy might not be the thing. The zero shift might be the thing. Mm-hmm. Or, or the noise might not be the thing. So there's all these little trade-offs that can be like, well, this suppressor is seven inches long, and this one's nine inches long. This one's eight ounces. This one's fourteen ounces. Like, what's important to you? So, if you're like looking to get a suppressor, like you really do have to make this list of what what's your top priority. Yeah, is it price? Because you might not have as much of a say in all these other things. Then, well, if it's weight, well, then you might not. You know, you might be stuck with a certain type of material. If it's length, okay, then we might not get it as quiet as you want. There's a lot of different things mm-hmm. that, but you do, like, I firmly believe you have to pick your top priority and then go down from there. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, again, I feel like at least in my head, I've, I've done that to a degree. Like, I don't really care if I take it on and off. Like, I don't, like, as far as like POI shift, like on off, like mm-hmm. I'm probably going to leave it on. Like, I don't see swapping it out a lot. You know, like I'm going to sight it in. Like if I'm, if I was hunting, you know, if we're coyote hunting or I was even going to Alaska or whatever. I'm going to side it in with the suppressor on. I'm going to put it in the case with the suppressor on, and I'm going to go hunting. There's no, like, I mean, I can't think of any reason. I was trying to think of that, too. Like, I personally wouldn't be taking it on an off whole lot. I mean, it's not like when you check it and you fly with an airplane or whatever, you're, you know, they when don't you call. check it. Well, like, just yesterday we had a customer here, a uh, law enforcement customer. Uh, their guns have to fit in a certain size box. Okay. So they oh. have to take their suppressor off every time they put it in their car. Hmm. So yeah, they have and, a different set of yep. needs and there that, for sure. That suppressor had first round pop numbers. It had uh, repeatability of attachment detachment numbers. It had um, you know it's full auto rated and it's it's all those things. Except when you put it one of one specimen out of a department when they put it on the gun, made a one minute AR10 an eight minute AR10. Oh, just the way that one worked out. Yikes. And that's not something, is is that something that you can predict ahead of time? Like, well, mm-hmm. I'm looking at this suppressor. It looks like it's got this, 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 and this. But, oh, not having bought it yet, I can see that my accuracy wouldn't be as good with it. Or that's just something you got to roll the dice and be that, like, that one. Oh, that one's kind this. of roll of dice because they had four Shoot. other specimens that didn't do that. Hmm. You might be, um, you might look at suppressors. Let's just say you go to... Uh, you know, go to silencershop.com or Silencer Central or whoever you're looking at, you might be like, oh, look at, there's 40 brands here on the side. How do I, how do I decide which brand to look at? You might research some of those companies and you would, you would find that a company like, you know, Thunderbeast, they, above all, they advertise that their suppressors don't have a POI shift mm-hmm. and that it'll either keep your accuracy or it'll make it better. Yep. Okay. That's and their that's their platform that they stand on. Like to my knowledge. Yep. Again, and they'll that's tell what you right I, to your face, not full auto rated. Yep. Okay. Well, then okay. then you got a company like Silencer Co. Silencer Co. has for a long time to me, it's looked like that they want to be the most modular. They want to be able to sure. and and you know, they're also the ones that kind of really push that the the normalizing of suppressors and so like getting more people in the market, that's kind of been the thing I've seen from them. 
dead air I've seen from them, like durability and a really good attachment system. So you'll start to, as you look at these different brands, and I'm not promoting any one or the other, but mm-hmm. I'll say like you will find in this world where you look and all of a sudden it's like, I got 40 decisions to make. Like which brand suppressor do I make? We'll start filtering those down. You right. might mm-hmm. find that you only have three decisions to make, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it might not be as complicated as it seems, but you do kind of you kind of want to be like, what's the what's the hill I'm going to die on? Like, is it is it accuracy? Is it point of impact shift? Is it how quick I can attach it and detach it? Is it cost? Is it size? Is it weight? Those are some of the things to really look at, and you might find that you don't truly have as many decisions to yeah. make as you think you do. Like yeah. I, th- I think even for both my rifles, accuracy, size, weight. That, that those are my mm-hmm. those are my three considerations. Well, and sound suppression and sound suppression. But I feel like that. I mean, no, it's not a given when it comes to suppressors because you do get some of those ones that are like those ultra mega short guys that go on the end of five five six ARs and probably still don't even make them hearing safe, but they at least cover up some blast. Mm-hmm. I'm sure well, it's targeted at an application, right? So, yeah. I'm, but what I'm getting at is that I, I was going to say, you know, well, you're getting a suppressor, so I'm sure it, at the very least it'll make it hearing safe. It's not necessarily guaranteed, I suppose, but. I mean, at, at least it's going to make it better than it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Adam and I play a lot with the, the K-sized suppressors. Mm-hmm. Like, that's kind of like the thing we've been, I don't know, it seems like at least maybe yeah. the thing we've been getting into as uh, as we continue to have our roles here at Vortex, like whether we be, you know, doing a demo for a law enforcement group or yep. we're here with a customer, um, a lot of times we find ourselves messing around with these like little shorty suppressors. And what do you like about those? Well, I think that you would look at that and if you compared that to, you know, a full size suppressor, you'd be like, well, that sucks. Like that's louder. It's, it's, uh, it's heavy. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing shoot house stuff in the stack, like I can tell you that your buddy in front of you is going to appreciate it because it's going to reduce down that blast and it's going to make it so that he doesn't lose all of his hearing. <laughs> Yeah, you right. know, well, like, yeah, and it's no. compact, right? So you can still maneuver it. So those are all those are all decisions, right? Yeah, yeah he'll I'll also appreciate it. not getting stuck in the back by an eight-inch suppressor. <laughs> yeah, also, is yes. that a suppressor? Or are you just really excited <laughs> for this uh, room clear? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean those those bring the blast down to an acceptable threshold without ruining the hair- handling characteristics of the gun. Yeah. So it's not yeah. like wow, that's heavy. And, yeah. you know, but at the same time, and then, you know, they're full auto rated and all that stuff. So they can heat up and they can stay heated up for a while. Cause, like we're not using, we're not sh- doing machine gun shoots, but if you go to a range day at like a trigger con or something like that, where a gun pretty much gets shot 10 rounds, five to 10 rounds every two to 10 minutes, like that can is going to be hot all day. So you yeah. start to need full auto rated on. Stuff I heard like a that, statistic so. that, mm. um, like on a on an AR, uh, typically every round can increase the temperature of the, the suppressor ten to fifteen degrees. Mm-hmm. So if you start out at ambient temperature, you know seventy degrees in the summer, eighty degrees in the summer, you know by one magazine in that thing's three hundred fifty four hundred degrees, right? So they get hot, and so yes. that's what Adam's kind of getting to is that like those those shorter cans, there's less material there. Mm-hmm. They might heat up a little faster, but they cool down faster. Mm-hmm. And yeah. and there's also not as much material deflection because they're as they heat up, they can you know start to stress relieve, right? Okay. Fun fact for folks at home: K stands for Kurtz, which is German, not compact. Yeah, a lot of Germ- a lot of German influence or homage to uh, German designs in the suppressor world. So that's where that's where the K comes from. It's used by tons Kurtz. of companies, yep. but generally K stands for the short one. Comes from there. Noted. Huh. Fun fact. If you get a really big, fat suppressor, do they call it F for Fram? Uh, uh, homage to the. Oil, I couldn't. Oil I couldn't filter. say for certain. Couldn't well, say there for is certain. an adap- <laughs> There the is an oil, oil filter uh, adapter that you can buy. That uh, you probably instantly makes you a felon, right? No, it has a serial number. You tax. You do oh, a. Okay. You buy it as a suppressor, but you thread on an oil filter. So I mean, you have to follow the same legal procedures, right? Or following the rules. But you thread on an oil filter, and that's your disposable little uh, suppressor. You do have to shoot the first hole through it, so mm-hmm. your your, uh, your first round accuracy isn't real great <laughs> from what I've heard. But, <laughs> yeah. That, that, a little unpredictable. There's your Fram reference. There you go. What, uh, what, do you guys, what do you guys recommend Mark look at? So, what, accuracy, size, weight. And well, I mean, sound and first round pop. 
Ruben Ruben dropped this brand already, but Thunder Beast, you're ta- you're you're a quintessential Thunder Beast customer okay. for what they're making. And then what's what's those other ones you have on the experience? Oh, the real lightweight ones. Yeah, uh, we have some Stinger Works cans. Yeah, those are cool um, too. Those are neat. Those are like nine, ten ounces. Lightweight. Dave likes that one. Oh, big fan. Those um, are the titanium ones, right? Yep, the titanium. I was just gonna ask. Titanium. They, they, they have a, my speed. They have Artillium. a titanium blast chamber where your initial blast happens, but then they actually have aluminum baffles and aluminum sleeve. Um, I've played a lot with the Wyoming Arms. The they're really small. They're four to five inches long, but those are you know that thing at four ounces is you know hmm. it 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 makes that shot especially out in the open prairie um it makes that first round on on uh on a hunt or something very very manageable mm-hmm. i mean you you will not uh to my knowledge you you won't see you know significant issues with hearing uh and then you know i guess um i've looked at you know, it's it's not a it's not small and lightweight but i've i've used a, a dead air uh sandman uh ti as my main hunting suppressor for a long time and it's quiet it's not lightweight but it's quiet Mm -hmm. it's so nice he bought it twice there you go that's true i've heard you mention that one numerous times dude it's just i mean i've got tens of thousands of rounds through it i've threaded it on a ton of different guns and it's never let me down he's he's being modest he's a big fan of the (laughs) (laughs) simple all right, now if the person isn't Mark and they're a general enthusiast who does a little bit of everything, maybe they don't get necessarily one, but they have the budget to get like two or three. What would they get? I mean, it depends on who they are. Do we, they do literally oh everything. Sometimes they shoot competitions, sometimes they hunt, sometimes they plank. Well, I, think, I mean, I think here's something to think about too. If mostly you're, center fire. If you, if you, okay, okay, so we'll just say this. If you're shooting ARs, and and you don't buy the piston ARs. OSS is a really good brand. You have the, to look at OSS. Those suppressors sure. are extremely yeah. freaking durable, and they're the, while their decibel rating numbers aren't going to be the reason why people would select it from the drop down list. Their tone's really good, and they don't have very much blowback in in in, in a gas gun, hmm. right? Okay. So so that the technology makes a lot of sense. Yep. Uh, we use a lot of them. Yep. I would say. Uh, Rimfire suppressors anywhere from, you know, I mean, actually, I think rimfire suppressors are pretty easy, but there's just a lot of options. Uh, I've messed with uh, Dead Air. I've messed with um, Silencer Co. Um, Surefire, like OSS, Liberty suppressors, like uh, a lot of really good rimfire options on the market. I didn't mean to put you guys on the spot with, like, name drops. That's okay. oh, for I mean, any suppressor friends and company friends out there, if we're, somehow we're pretty much friends with all of them. I know. So. I, I, I don't, mean, I, we don't want to ever not mention one, but yeah, no. But I mean, like these are like these are also coming from like personal experience. So right, yeah. it's not a not a like a vortex endorsement of this one. This is just what I have experience with. Yeah. So um, based off of purchasing history and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So I mean, yeah. If you see a lot of good reviews about it, you see a lot of people using it. You know, ask questions. But there's there's it's a it's a buy once cry once item, and so you're not you don't typically see people, you know, using stuff that is subpar. I'll throw one out there that I I wish I would have gotten two of. I don't I, yeah I guess I'll say I wish I would have gotten two of instead of one of them and then one of these uh like the Saker. I wish I would have just gotten two harvesters from Silencer Co. Yeah, like the thirty cal harvester. It's a pretty mm-hmm. sweet can. It's a great can mm-hmm. because it's uh it's semi auto rated if I'm not mistaken. You can shoot it on a semi auto. And uh, it's a 30 cal can. I put it on all my hunting guns because it's not terribly heavy. Hmm. But then, in in you know, should you need it, you or need to, you could put it on like a 308 AR10 or something like that. Now it's 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 lighter weight, so I'm sure that it probably would heat up quicker and maybe give you some more, like mirage off the suppressor and stuff in your scope. Yeah, but. I don't. Um, I don't personal. This isn't my personal experience. Um, but like. There's there's some suppressors out there too that are incorporating like a more of a, a I wouldn't call it a quick attach mount but I wouldn't definitely wouldn't call it a direct thread you know mounts that have taper like yeah, taper it's lock an, it's an acme thread to a taper shoulder yeah and so you, you'll see hmm. some suppressors out there that are you know either threaded for that they come with it or they can be adapted to like a taper lock so it's not necessarily uh, a direct thread it's not a quick attach but it's somewhere in the middle where you 
you you hand thread it on, but it's only a certain amount of threads. You're not sitting there spinning it on all day. So there's some good options on the market for that. Um, yeah, that I mean that Omega Nine K. You can you can throw it on a centerfire rifle. You can throw it on uh, a nine mil. Oh, you can mil. throw that one on a centerfire. Yeah, <laughs> you know they don't they don't recommend it because the decibel rating isn't great. But durability wise, it's very uh, very durable can. So mm, you're not going to wreck it. <laughs> Um, I've, I've hunted with it. I've hunted with it. It knocks the sound down to a very manageable level. Um, but then you can take that, put a booster in it, a Nielsen vice, thread it on a pistol and then throw a direct, for a day. yeah, throw a direct thread mount on it, thread it on a, you know, on a, you know, like a MP5 or a sub gun. I've got one of those Kalashnikov KP nines. Uh, you can switch it to, I mean, they're super, super like a, like we said earlier, it's kind of an outlier. It's one of those cans that you can do a lot of stuff with. That's cool. And if you got an AK, you got to get a Wolverine. So, AK very hard to suppress. BBS one. And if you don't have an AK, you got to get an AK. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 They are very hard to suppress. Yeah, kind of like Ruben was talking before with the with the port port pop. Well, that happens with an AK at the gas block. Yep. So you have a suppressor on the front, and then but all the noise comes out hmm. around the piston. But then, what does a suppressor designed for an AK do that others don't? Uh, they're a little bit. I mean, they're they're kind oh, of they're kind the of a compromise, but they're they're definitely targeted towards uh, the threading issues of yeah. hmm. of com block manufactured stuff. Yeah, guns coming out of third world countries or com block like you know old guns that are uh, the threading is not necessarily concentric to the bore, so they'll they'll actually go to like a bigger it's an oversized bore diameter on the suppressor, so you have lower likelihood of uh, baffle strikes. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that's a that's a huge thing. Um, I'll say one thing. T- uh, one thing also, uh, if you're getting into the suppressor world, you know, look at places like Silencer Shop and and Silencer Central. I mean, we, there's there's tons of great dealers out there all across the country that sell suppressors. You know, some of these places too, like the the Silencer Shop kiosk is really neat because, uh, well, like Mark said initially, right, like that paperwork is just it's daunting. Like I don't, what if I screw it up? What if I do it wrong? Uh, you know, what you're going to do is like, you basically go into, you know, make a profile. It's going to do your, do your photos. It's going to do, um, all of your address and everything like that. And you buy a suppressor. And then, then the next time you buy a suppressor, it saves all of it. So you walk into a shop, you buy a suppressor and it automatically sends your oh. completed paperwork in. So you don't even have to do anything. You can docu sign it from home actually. Mm, um, that's so the answer. I like that. And, and I think that maybe that speaks to why, like like I said earlier, like it sounds like over half the suppressors bought in this country are bought via a kiosk like that, and they're all over the place. So when you're talking about pictures, what pictures? Uh, you need to oh, do a passport. Face. You need to do a passport photo when you buy a suppressor. Can you do like a fun Snapchat filter? No. In fact, it no. Has, you know it has, it has to literally be. The, you can't even smile, Mark. Why like don't it's in you the rules. try you can't it? Smile. No. <laughs> but wow, uh, you can't smile. Really, yeah, you can't smile on a passport photo. Apparently. Yeah, I try and. Jason I might have Bourne to go it. back and uh, redo mine. But yeah, Silencer Shop, Silencer Central, those places have the the real automated, easy checkout way to do it. So I mean, um, like I said, that first time takes a little bit longer, mm-hmm. but it's not much longer. But then you're kind of done when you're done. But then you can go on, add to cart, ship it to your local FFL, go in when you get your tax stamp. Um, there is still you know that waiting period, but mm-hmm. two suppressors are cool. There's becoming less and less excuses. If I were terribly honest, um, my wife showed me a W4 this morning before mm-hmm. I came into work that she wanted help with. I was far more intimidated by that form than I am by Form 4 <laughs> for the ATF. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a, well, a that's fam- the ATF, familiarity difference there, too, that's though. Cause the, that's because Adam looks at the Form 4 or Form 1 and goes, yeah, this, this, this. And then when then it gets to the ATF, they're like, yeah, it's Adam. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Second time this like, month. I was like, whoa, dependence. Again. What? I don't know. The <laughs> ATF, uh, you know, like, while I will say that there, there can be some pain in doing that paperwork, it sounds like, uh, from what I've heard around the industry, is that the ATF is trying to streamline things a little bit. So right now I know, like, let's just say four months ago you – did a form four for a suppressor and you do another one now if they haven't processed your other one they'll take your most recent one put it and then they process them all at once oh so do one get it in line and then do some yeah. more later oh no kidding huh so it's not like these like chunks of time like oh 
That's interesting. That's really cool. Hmm. They just put it in your pile, in yep. your suppressor pile. Yep. And then when they're done, they're done. Get a Mark pile going, Mark. I'm going to do it. Do it. He's going to do it, everybody. Dude, cans are cool. Hopefully. Cans are cool. Make the shirt. Hopefully, everybody uh, <laughs> Hopefully, everybody out there. They're actually hot. You're, uh, you're all thinking about it now. Um, I just got what you said there. I was trying to process it. Hopefully, you're all thinking about it now, though. Getting a suppressor if you don't already have one. Uh, it's awesome. We, uh, we can't stress it enough. And hopefully, this has been a little bit of a help to you, yeah. too, if you're trying to figure out which one to get, like Mark here was. And, uh, yeah. If, if, you you have, have, if you have questions, if more you do, questions about suppressors. Hit us up in the comments section below if you're watching on YouTube or over on Instagram. And uh, if not, normally I like to say stuff like, oh, let us know what kind of suppressor you've got. But I'm sure that it's probably also at the bottom of a lake. So uh, perhaps we <laughs> Even need to Even though you already registered it. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we need to address the, uh, the boat problem that everybody seems to be having. I don't even think lake. I'm going to go buy one. I'm just going to go diving. Sure. <laughs> the ocean, the ocean floor is just littered with suppressors. Yeah, exactly. Um, so cool. With that said, uh, thanks everybody for listening. As usual, we'll see you on the next one. Bye. 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 There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.